Hello, Malaysia, and welcome to another edition of Medical Today. I'm Jared Rudnam, and as always, we have a fantastic show lined up for you. We're going to be talking about NCDs. More importantly, with regards to NCDs, we'll be talking about heart disease, a little something that apparently doesn't discriminate. We'll be having a cardiologist coming in very soon. Later on the show, we'll be talking about bariatric surgery. Now, do you know what bariatric surgery is? If you do, good on you. If you don't, stay with us. We'll come back and give you more information as to what that is. In the meantime, uh, what we want to know is uh, if we're learning more about medication. Well, on the show every week, we try to give you information about the medication you are taking. Now, we have a recording with uh, Zulhazri Razali. He's a director and also a pharmacist with the commercial division of Farman Yaga Burhat. We did speak to him at his office, and we have an interview with regards to what he had to say about knowing your medicine. Here is that interview. Let's take a look at it. Medicine uh, is a preparation or something that is being used to, for the treatment or prevention of disease. Okay? There are so many different preparations in Malaysia or in the world where they have gone through a proper uh, test or analysis uh, by the authority and they were categorized into different uh, level of medicine. can be a quite a serious one and to the lowest uh, category of uh, medicine. There are several benefits and risks that you can talk about uh, medicine. It depends on the nature of the medicine. For example, like something to do with to reduce blood pressure, all right? Or something to do with to, to prevent your stomach acid, okay? So it depends on the disease or the treatment that you are getting from the doctor. They'll give you different kind of medicines for different benefits. When it comes to the risk, also every medicine, when you, when you go to the specific product, of course the doctor will tell you the kind of risk that you are going to get if you take such medicine. It all depends on the patient and the doctor uh, uh, engagement. Okay? When the doctor prescribes to you certain medicine for certain condition, they will also tell you the risk. Okay? And this uh, risk actually they will weigh against the benefits and they will prescribe with the right dosage, with the right timing, so that the patient will get more benefits that outweigh the risk. Okay, for example, like uh, if you take uh, flu medicine, for example, you will get uh, drowsiness, right? So if you really need to take that medicine, of course the doctor will say that you need to uh, skip driving or doing any physical thing because it will affect your 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 physical body. There are various levels of side effects of medicine. It can be as uh, little as stomach upset or skin rashes, up to liver failure in fact. Right? So these side effects actually it depends on the product that you are, or the drug or the medicine that you are taking or you are given by the doctor. Okay? So most important is you understand what was given to you Okay, you can ask the doctor what are those and of course the doctor will willingly tell you the range of side effects that are related to that product and they will also tell you things that you should not do while taking the drug. And uh, also there are certain medicine that when you take, you've got to take for example after meal. So there's a reason about it. Maybe by taking after meal, they will reduce your stomach upset. So these are the things that 
if you understand well about what you are taking, then you are pretty okay in terms of managing the side effects. Again, as I said, uh, it depends on the drug. There are some drugs, the side effect is very minimal, like skin rashes or, or the drowsiness. It's quite simple. But then again, you have a side effects where it can really make your, your system go bad. For example, like liver failure or maybe side effects of kidney failure because certain painkillers, for example, if you take too much, it can damage your kidney. So these are the things that you really have to understand the, the medicine. You've got to take as prescribed. The compliance is important and the re regular visit to the doctor and seek the advice from the pharmacy is important especially when you take the more critical drug, more chronic uh, disease drug, hypertension, uh, what we call, or maybe the cancer product. These are the things that are very high risk and very quite, called, quite dangerous side effects. There is no real uh, what we call guideline or things that we have to do on expired goods at home. Okay, most of the time I think people throw in the, in the drainage or in the in the dustbin. So personally, I think just to make to minimize what we call any uh, dangerous thing that thrown out elsewhere, I suggest we just crush the thing pack it properly and leave it to the what we call uh, uh, garbage collector so that at least we know those people who collect garbage thing they will incinerate it right but to prevent expired goods of course you've got to be disciplined as well right you've got to consume as prescribed normally the health professional will not give you too excessive quantity of medicine right they will give you a certain time, so they expect you to finish it off. So your compliance also important. And when it comes to certain medicine that you can buy over the counter, again, you've got to be very disciplined in, in buying certain things within your time frame. That means you can assure that you can finish it off before it expires. So that's the first thing that you've got to do to prevent any expired goods uh, left in your at your home. My advice is you must seek your advice or your uh, your your seeking your, your medicine information from the right channel. Okay, mainly on the pharmacy and the doctor. All right. These are the two areas where you definitely can get uh, proper advice or proper knowledge about the medicine that you are taking or you are going to take. Okay. Try to avoid social media or friends advice or anything that non-professional in terms of uh, medicine information. Understanding the medicine that you take is important. There are so many sources or channels that you can ask from. But the most important is you should ask from the professional, which is the doctors or the pharmacy. So when you go to the pharmacy, you can see a lot of products on the shelf. So you must understand which particular one is suitable for you. If you have a severe disease or severe things that you need to be treated, of course, the doctor will give to you. At the same time, when you go to the pharmacy, you can always, always ask them things that you have been taken or you are given by the doctor. But, but please, do not source your information from the non-professional way, which is the uh, social media or the friends or any other channel, which is not really uh, the right way of taking advice. So please drop by to the nearest pharmacy like the Royal Pharma, the pharmacist will welcome you and will be able to advise you on anything to do with your medicine that you are taking for yourself. Thank you.
gain insights from the people with the capacity to translate vision into reality. Interviews with corporate leaders. Monday, only on BNC. Brings you the latest in current affairs, lifestyle and entertainment. As well as one-on-one -on -one discussions with fascinating personalities. Only on Onama News Channel. Kemajuan sains dan teknologi dalam perubatan sekalipun tidak mungkin mencipta darah. Ia hanya diperolehi melalui proses pendermaan secara sukarela. Darah yang didermakan akan diawasi agar berada dalam keadaan baik, selamat dan mencukupi. Seorang penderma boleh menyelamatkan tiga orang pesakit yang memerlukan darah atau komponen darah. Termasuklah saya. Saya juga merupakan salah seorang yang pernah menerima darah yang telah anda dermakan. Terima kasih kerana menyelamatkan nyawa saya. Nine Eleven menampilkan pelbagai segmen menarik khas buat anda. Saksikan Nine Eleven setiap Isnin hingga Jumaat 9 pagi hanya di Bernama News Channel. Ada idea nak makan apa? Ah, parah, parah, mari, mari. Tak tahu nak makan kat mana. Wow, inilah pencuci mulut yang saya tunggu-tunggu ni. Ada banyak kedai makan dengan seribu satu menu yang saya boleh cadangkan. Ah, tengoklah. Oh, dia punya sedap tu mana kelas lah. Ha, anda kenalah tonton koleksi tapak apa setiap Selasa tempat setengah petang. Brings you the latest in current affairs, lifestyle and entertainment. One-on-one -on -one discussions with fascinating personalities. Only on Onama News Channel. Gain insights from the people with the capacity to translate vision into reality. Interviews with corporate leaders, Monday, only on BNC. Thank you for staying with us right here on Medical Day. As promised, we're going to be talking about heart disease. And uh, all of us know that heart disease strikes everywhere or everyone, regardless of gender, age, and also your weight. Or at least that's what science tells us today. Now, joining me in the studio is a consultant cardiologist, Dr. Chong Yun Sin, who's come all the way from Park City. He's from Ramsey Saim Dabi Healthcare and he's with Park City and he's joining us today to talk about heart disease. Now, there's a lot to be talked about and, and also to be discussed about with regards to heart disease. Now, uh, how common 
is heart disease today as opposed to say 10 years ago? Um, nowadays, heart disease is one of the most common medical conditions in Malaysia. All right, beside number one, which is the road traffic accident, the followed by that is actually the heart problems. We have about six to eight percent of the, the uh, population actually mm -hmm. having some form of heart disease, whether mm -hmm. it's the rhythm problems, the valve problems, or coronary artery disease problem. So, heart disease has become a major medical problem in today's country. Right. It's very interesting because 13 years ago I had a heart attack and the cardiologist that looked after me at that point mm. was very young and I said, look, you know, uh, you look pretty young to be a cardiologist uh, using a catheter and uh, doing yeah. uh, invasive procedures. And he said, hey, uh, you don't have to worry because we've got so much to practice on in Malaysia. And that, <laughs> because he was, what he was trying to tell me that uh, back then heart disease was very prevalent and yes. uh, no, up until now, with all the programs we have to uh, give people awareness about heart problems, it's still not getting the message out there. Do you think people are getting the message about uh, People get the message, but they just don't practice it. Mm -hmm. all right? 30 years ago, uh, the common disease are infectious disease, right. TB, you know, pneumonia, you know, skin infection, and so on. But today, the, the, the demographic totally changed. We see young people, 30 years old, early 30s, who come with heart problems, heart attacks, rhythm problem, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and we look at the populations that with the young population that are coming now, they become more and more, and it's a major concern to the country. Right. Yeah. And uh, usually, and this group of people are the product, you know, in the productive golden age for the country mm -hmm. because they contribute to the economics. Mm -hmm. And once they strike with the heart problems, you know, it can be fatal. Now, know? once you have a heart problem, they say. Uh, your life changes forever and you know you see people uh, who have heart problems they, they come to you um, and you meet them uh, they find out you give them the bad news that they have a heart, they had a heart attack uh, heart muscles uh, died mm -hmm. lifestyle has to change do people take these things seriously when you talk to them and of course you know alarm bells ring when you tell them you know you know your heart certain percentage of your heart is not working anymore you'll have to live on medication for the rest of your life but you know, alarm bells ring at that point. But do when they come back to you for subsequent checkups, have they changed their lifestyle? Um, most of them, the if let's say they listen, you know, they actually uh, change their lifestyle. All right, especially smoking, diet, exercise, and on regular medications and medical checkup with us, they actually do very very well. Mm -hmm. For those small percentage of them who actually ignore what the, our advice is. Uh, ignore the medication, continue smoke, they do badly. Yeah. They do badly. One of the best examples, because nowadays we have modern technology and modern science, you know, doctors, we have the technology and we have the knowledge to say that how can you take care of your heart. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time is that example I give you is Mahathir. Mahathir actually have a heart attack when he was 40, 50 years old. And she went through two bypass still strong today, 93 years old, become a prime minister. Yeah, you know what's yeah. they're telling me? I can lead a bad lifestyle and still yeah. go for bypass and yeah, live yeah. for... Yeah. Because, because she's very, you know, she's very disciplined and she listened to all medical advices. Right. Yeah. So it is about uh, essentially taking that medical advice and using it, applying it to life. So always when we hear this cliche like lifestyle changes, you need to make lifestyle changes. We, most of us don't take it seriously. Like mm -hmm. for instance, now uh, people have given up smoking, but they've now, they now smoke their batteries, you know, everyone's yes. vaping. Yes. And I, I have a lot of friends, even friends behind this camera, who are watching me now, saying that, you know, vaping is not bad at all. What, is, what are your thoughts on vaping? Of course, I didn't, I, I know I'm springing this up on you last minute, but it's something <laughs> that yeah. needs to be talked yeah. about. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in um, um, uh, these are bad habits, I would say. Number one, smoking, you know, uh, we always advise it's possible you don't smoke, all right? And you can always count the number of cigarettes that you smoke, all right? right? You can say, tell me one packet, 20, pa 20 stick per day, and so on. So we know the number that you smoke. Whipping is you control yourself, all right? So, you know, you feel like putting how much nicotine inside, you put yourself. And nobody guide you on how much amount is it. So a lot of time, you actually develop a, a, a nicotine toxicity you know when you when you when you when you take this uh, inhale right. so a lot of time is like uh, uh, that's why what there's one point in time that ministry of health actually tried to ban it because you're actually causing toxicity to your body mm -hmm. and that actually can stimulate heart problems 
All right. So uh, I don't encourage that. You, you don't encourage vaping. Yeah. Of course, there are cardiologists out there who say that vaping is not half as bad as smoking. <laughs> There's some people who still believe that when you smoke uh, light, cig light lighter cigarettes or you buy, uh, there's a certain brand, there's a light brand, uh, you buy the lighter brand and it's uh, better. You know, st still a lot of people yeah. who are, are out there doing things like yeah. this, but all in all, smoking is bad. What about smoking uh, comes into play when it is, it deals with, uh, it, when we talk about heart problems, you know, what in smoking is bad for the heart? You know, smoking is already known. I mean, the, you know, is 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 the evidence that actually causing heart problem. Because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times that in, in terms of the heart, if you smoke, you don't realize it. The smoke actually went inside the body system, and go through the blood uh, blood vessels and actually damage the blood vessels. And once the blood vessel is damaged, causing inflammation, uh, cholesterol and inflammatory cell will stick to the area and causing accumulation of cholesterol plaque. That's why a lot of people who smoke tend to have multiple cholesterol lesions or cholesterol plaque in the blood vessel when we do the angiogram. So w w what you're trying to say in turn is that um, it, is, it ups your risk of getting a heart attack if yes. you're a smoker. Yes. Yeah, you want to keep the risk low all the time. It's, it's a game of numbers, so to speak. Correct. So you keep the numbers down mm -hmm. at all times. Now, they say that there's a hereditary link uh, to a uh, heart disease yes and uh, heart disease does discriminate the, apparently they told me I'm Indian and your your risk is high is that yes. true um, they are they are genetic linked to the uh, heart disease yes mm -hmm. it's true you let's say the uh, sad news yeah though. sad news. <laughs> you let's say the parents actually have a, a heart disease at age of 50 mm -hmm. all right uh, this, the next generation if they don't take care the risk is actually ten, one decade earlier right. one decade earlier so people who actually have Strong family is a heart disease. I always advise them to have early checkup, mm -hmm. all right, and take care of themselves, all right, on in terms of healthy lifestyle. Right. Yeah. So it's very interesting to know that when you say Malay or Indian, they'll say your risk of having a heart attack, uh, uh, your, your your risk is much higher, and, and that is true. Studies have shown mm -hmm. that heart disease does does discriminate. Why is it not prevalent amongst the Chinese? If you ask me nowadays, I mean, that we treated in Malaysia, Malay, Chinese, Indian. We mm -hmm. tend to say Indian, but in today's world, today, all right, I would say all young people are high, high risk, you know, mm -hmm. because of the lifestyle. All right, it doesn't matter whether which race are you in. Right. right? If right. you don't take care of your diet, with smoking, poor diets, a lot of uh, high cholesterol diet, you will get it. Mm -hmm. You will get it. Right. So. Uh, one, once you get a heart attack, so there are ways of making sure that, you know, after you've had a heart attack, you can still lead a normal life. Yes, Marty has proven that. Ma Marty has proven that. So with people who are coming to see you now, you know, with intervention, what kind of early intervention can be done uh, these days in order to ensure that one doesn't get a heart attack? Because uh, I think the, the idea here is to ensure that the person doesn't get a myocardial infarction Correct. or a heart attack per Correct. se. Yeah. Because nowadays heart disease is something that is a preventable disease. Mm -hmm. all right? We do not want a person to get a heart attack. The moment is you get a heart attack is equal to muscle damage and your heart can stop. Right? So that is something that we do not want. Mm -hmm. So the technology has given us a lot of information that we can actually prevent you from getting a heart attack by screening and prevention. Right. What about women? The, some say that the uh, estrogen protects women from having heart attacks. Is that true? Partially true. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, yeah, uh, you know, let's say, let's say, you know, if a lady you come to me, you know, they are having uh, uh, in the menstrual period of time, meaning they're having before menopause. Right. The, the hormone actually protect the heart. Mm -hmm. It really protect the heart. It, it, it prevent the cholesterol from deposit in the blood vessel. So mm -hmm. they are actually protected. But if let's say they have strong family history of uh, uh, heart disease, if they smoke and they don't take care of the diet, some of them do get very bad coronary artery disease. Right. So, of course, there, there again, it depends on, it varies with different individuals. Right. Right. Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going to find out about symptoms. Everyone says your left arm starts to hurt when you have a heart attack. Some people believe that you know, when you sweat, perspire, over perspire, you're going to have a heart attack. Some people say they have a striking pain coming down their chest. What does all this mean and what are the early signs and symptoms 
of a heart attack. When we come back, we'll delve into that right here on Medical Today. Stay with us. அரசியல் பொருளாதாரம் சமூகவியல் அறிவியல் விளையாட்டு கலை இலக்கியம் அனைத்துலக செய்தி என உடனுக்குடன் தகவல்களை கொண்டு வருகிறோம் புதிய பொழிவோடு புதிய நம்பிக்கையோடு பர்னாமா தமிழ் செய்திகள் பர்னாமா அலைவரிசையில் மட்டுமே Jangan main beli aja ikut nafsu. Pastikan telefon yang hendak dibeli ada label MCMC. Hello, Pak. Dah beli phone? <tuh> Itulah kanda cakap. Beli peralatan komunikasi dan wireless harus pastikan ada label MCMC. Label MCMC menunjukkan peralatan tersebut selamat dan mematuhi standard yang ditetapkan oleh MCMC di setiap peralatan komunikasi dan wireless yang anda beli. Ceklah, cek tahu, jangan tak cek. Ada label. Anda selamat. Anda ingin menjadi kaya, tetapi awas. Terdapat banyak skim-skim pelaburan tidak sah di pasaran. Jika ragu-ragu, anda boleh jumpa kami untuk memahami formula TIPU. Apa itu TIPU? T tidak akan rugi. I indah khabar dari lupa. P luang hanya sekali. U untung besar. Ingat dan berwaspada dengan formula TIPU ini. Untuk sebarang pertanyaan mengenai pasaran modal, anda boleh hubungi kami. Rakan kuasa pengguna musim kedua kembali. Persiaran sejak Rabu pukul sembilan malam hanya di Bernama News Channel. Nine Eleven menampilkan pelbagai segmen menarik khas buat anda. Saksikan Nine Eleven setiap Isnin hingga Jumaat 9 pagi hanya di Bernama News Channel. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam and together with me is Dr. Chong Yun Sin, a consultant cardiologist from Ramsey Syme Derby Healthcare. And we're talking about my favorite disease, uh, heart disease, and he has specialized in it for a long time. He's also worked on a team helping Tun Mahathir with his uh, second bypass, yeah? And uh, it's good to know that you've kept the man alive and he's here for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> we're all happy to have him. Well, um, had that, that aside, we always talk about, we always think we have symptoms of heart problems. A lot of people get a, a pain like lightning down the chest. You know, you know how people describe pain in different ways. And uh, when they get, uh, say, a pain in the chest, they believe it's probably a heart problem. So when do you tell, that? when can you uh, know, or rather, wh when would it show that you're having a heart problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of time is that the public actually you know, aware that, you know, when you have a chest pain, mm -hmm. when you're sweating, when you have pain radiating to the arm, you know, that's heart attack, all right? But a lot of time is that the, the people who come to us, which is a cardiologist who come to us, the pain can be very, very, all right? So they can have chest pain, they can have uh, epigastric pain, which mm -hmm. a lot of time they thought is gastric, it's actually a heart attack. Right. Right. So epigastric pain is here near the sternum. Correct, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some, some, some of the uh, patients actually develop difficult to breathe. Mm -hmm. So that is actually signs of a heart attack as well. Mm -hmm. And usually, if let's say a person suddenly sweat a lot, all right, mm -hmm. and it, the shirt all wet, 
that's something that I'm very concerned about, whether it's a heart attack or not. If a person suddenly faint, you know, collapse, you know, that is also another sign of but heart attack. Some people always feel, you know, they, they have costochondritis mm. and they believe, oh, I think it's, a, it's, you know, every time they breathe, they feel a pain. Mm. Some people panic with that and they believe it's, yeah. it's heart problems. Yeah. So, you know, how do you, how can we give out advice now to kind of ascertain whether it's muscular or it's, or it's a heart attack? Um, yeah. It can be difficult. It mm. can be difficult. Usually, let's say you have some sort of a, a discomfort around the chest area, you're not sure. You know, please come and see a doctor and do some simple basic tests right. to rule out whether there's a heart attack or not. It's very interesting because when I had a heart attack, of course, you know, this is information I'm divulging over a national TV. When I had it, it felt like I wanted to belch, but I couldn't. Mm. And it kept getting worse and mm. worse. And then you start breaking into sweat. But I was aware at all times as to what was happening around me, you know, mm. just that it felt like you wanted to belch, but you couldn't, mm. and it started, your chest starts to tighten. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Some, sometimes the, the symptoms can be vary from individual to individual, mm -hmm. male to female. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time, you know, let's say it's a female, the symptoms can be more severe, all right, yeah, can be more of difficult to breathe. And in elderly patients, sometimes the symptoms can be just unwell. They're just unwell. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say any symptom that persists and doesn't go off, you know, please see uh, any any of the doctors. You know, to rule out any acute conditions. Right. Mm. And when you read articles or, or blogs from uh, medical health practitioners in the UK, this was something I read 10, 15 years ago, and they say, you know, you always have to take whether you have a heart problem or not. You need to take at least a baby aspirin to make sure your your blood's thin. Why did, haven't we practiced stuff like that here in Malaysia? Um, as you know, by right, let's say you have any heart attack, the first thing to do is actually take any of the blood thinner because that actually really helps mm -hmm. because the clot is not formed well yet. So the moment you take a blood thinner, it dissolves it and that saves life. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the aspirin is not widely available all mm -hmm. right, uh, in, in, the, in the stores and things like that. In places like America, they have baby aspirin right. widely available in the commercial, those uh, sundry shops, mm -hmm. you know, which is 81 milligram. And that can be, you know, you just buy like in Seven Eleven, in, in right. things like that. Yeah, over the counter. Yeah. Correct, yeah. correct. So the, and do not need prescription. But here's the other thing, you know, with, with medication for the heart, there's also side effects that come along with it. A lot of people who are on cholesterol uh, medication or cholesterol drugs like statins mm -hmm. have bodily aches. You know, mm -hmm. they find it hard to deal with with the bodily aches. So what do you do when 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 you're presented with problems like these? You know, let's say any any of the patients who usually who have heart problems, all right, uh, they usually have hypertension, cholesterol, sugar, and so on. And usually, uh, uh, I would give you know the medication based on each of these disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, and usually the patient will come back to me uh, to follow up and see whether the medication work or not, right. whether any side effect or not. And uh, uh, and and if there's any side effect arise, you know, uh, we we know what to deal with it. Uh, a lot of time is that nowadays the medication, the side effect is actually very, very minimal compared to our grandparent time, you know, mm -hmm. they say all medication cause kidney problems. Nowadays it's actually very minimal. And like uh, what you mentioned just now, the statin, all right, the, uh, the muscle pain is actually not common, mm -hmm. all right, it's about one in 100,000 patients or populations. So it's actually quite rare. But, but the moment you, if you have that, then be aware of that, you can stop it and you can deal with some other okay, issue. Okay, and what about blood thinners? So, <coughs> I mean, the safest or the, the first go-to standard would be aspirin. Correct. And if you're having gastritis yep. or high acidity, it, kinds, uh, it kind of gives you uh, gas gastro problems, Correct. right? Then you move on to stuff like clopidogrel, yep. uh, and it goes up. Uh, wh what's, what's new in the range of blood thinners these days? Um, the blood thinners are, um, you know, aspirin is the oldest one. It has been around for the past 400 years and it's proven to be effective mm -hmm. and it's cheap. But the problem is that it causes gastritis, you know. There are about 10% of the population can't really take aspirin. So we move on to uh, Plavix, which is around for the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's doing quite well. Right. And of course, there so are So Plavix is the brand name, Clopidogrel is the drug oh, right. we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. the newer medication mm -hmm. like Brillanta, which is more expensive. Uh, on you know we put it as a second line. Wait, wait, when you say if it's more expensive, is it safer? Yes, it's safer. Mm -hmm. It's safer. But the thing is that it's newer, you know, so it's more expensive. So, so yeah. every time something is newer, it's more expensive. So if I were to put clopidogrel with Brillanta and say which one's safer, 
Would you say Brillanta is safer? I would say same. Same, it's yeah. the same. Yep. Yeah. So um, with understanding heart disease and also uh, keeping yourself safe from heart disease, what would be your advice to all of us? Uh, stay healthy mm -hmm. and prevention. These are the two things that is key. Stay healthy means that uh, number one, you know, make sure you do exercise regularly. All right, mild to moderate exercise is good for the heart. Strenuous exercise is actually bad for the bones and muscles. Mm -hmm. All right, so exercise means that uh, three times a week, half an hour, any form of exercise that right. you want to do. So all of us have got um, counters now to tell <laughs> us how. No, give us our yeah. beats per minute yes. and uh, whatever. Everyone's very health conscious. So essentially, three times per week, hum, uh, you know, how high do you want to bring your heart rate up uh, to? The, the, the recommended is actually 220 minus your age. Okay. All right? So 220 minus your age. If you can achieve 85% of the target heart rate of that, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. It's good enough. So 220 minus your age. And if you can achieve 85% of that, that's what you're looking for Correct. at least three times a week. Yes. And that's the bare minimum. Correct. Right. With treatment options, what are the bigger treatment options out there? They're stenting, ballooning. The, the treatment nowadays we have divided into three. One is medication, of course. All right. Mm -hmm. Medication basically to thin the blood, to make the blood vessel more relaxed, lower the cholesterol level, lower the sugar levels, and lower the hypertension. Um, the, 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 the treatment, you know, further treatment, let's say if it's a very tight uh, cholesterol lesion, then we can always go for angioplasty, which is a balloon, putting a small balloon into the blood coronary artery or the heart. And nowadays it's actually very uh, simplified, all right? Uh, you know, it can be done uh, uh, in, in a daycare procedure. We give some painkiller on the wrist, all right? And then put a small needle, 1.8 mm plastic tube, 1.8 mm mm -hmm. and go straight to the heart and we can find the blood vessels and uh, in order to proceed with the balloon you know it takes about another 10 minutes and right. that's it all right and it's done and you go home six <coughs> hours later but if let's say certain cases which is unfortunately multiple block very complex very difficult we may suggest for a bypass which is open heart that carry a bigger risk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but with bypass surgeries these days it's it's not what it was 25 30 years yes, ago yes, yeah yes. you know after a week you're out of the hospital correct mm -hmm. so things are getting better with regards to health care and heart care and uh, techniques are getting better medications med medications getting more uh, focused now and uh, we've got better things coming uh, your way the only thing is whatever you do with regards to heart problems make sure you spe see a specialist like Dr. Chong here and find out if you're not sure. Never self-medicate, never Dr. Google when it uh, relates to the heart or if it's a matter of the heart. On that note, Dr. Chong, it was a pleasure and an honor having you here. Thank you very Thank much you. for joining us. Uh, we hope to have you back again so we can do more of a discussion yes. with regards to heart care or, and health care right here on Medical Today. We'll take a short break and come back right after this break. Stay with <coughs> us. This is Medical Today on the Bernama News Channel. Gain insights from the people with the capacity to translate vision into reality. Interviews with corporate leaders, Monday, only on BNC. அரசியல் பொருளாதாரம் சமூகவியல் அறிவியல் விளையாட்டு கலை இலக்கியம் அனைத்துலக செய்தி என உடனுக்குடன் தகவல்களை கொண்டு வருகிறோம் புதிய பொலிவோடு புதிய நம்பிக்கையோடு பர்னாமா தமிழ் செய்திகள் பர்னாமா அலைவரிசையில் மட்டுமே Gain insights from the people with the capacity to translate vision into reality Interviews with corporate leaders, Monday, only on BNC.
Listen to views of industry captains. Analyze and examine trends and projections. Gain market insights from subject matter experts. Biz Talk, every Friday, only on BNC. The Nation, a talk show from the Current Affairs Desk with in-depth conversations on health, women, poverty, culture and performing arts. Only on the Nama News Channel. Do you know what really happens to your mobile e-waste? Throwing them into the dustbin will only result in choking the landfills. Did you know that over 42 million mobile e-waste are not properly disposed of? And this amount will continue to grow. This will potentially cause toxic chemicals to seep into the ground. The environment will slowly be polluted, thus creating a multitude of health problems to us humans. Did you know that 90% of the materials used to make mobile phones and the accessories can be recovered and recycled? These can be reused to make anything and everything including electrical goods. Well, the good news is MCMC has initiated a mobile e-waste campaign. MCMC along with telecommunications companies have set up collection areas for the public to safely dispose their mobile e-waste at participating outlets. With 72 outlets nationwide including TM, U-Mobile, Maxis, DG, Cellcom and Altel, you can now dispose your e-waste easily and at your convenience. Join us to get 1 million recycled mobile e-waste for this campaign. Make a difference for a better world, better environment and better future. For more information, log on to mobileewaste.mcmc.gov.my. This initiative is brought to you by the Malaysian Communications Industry together with MCMC. Hello and welcome back to the final segment of Medical Today. As promised, we're going to explain to you and find out what bariatric surgery is all about. Joining me in the studio is Dr. Pok Eng Hong. He's a consultant general surgeon from Ramsey Syme Darby Healthcare and is here to talk about uh, being overweight, uh, how that links into NCDs and also to understand a little bit about what bariatric surgery is. Dr. Pok, thank you very much for joining us. It's good to have you here now. Nice with you. Uh, well, when we talk about weight loss surgery, I guess it is bariatric surgery. So how do you explain this to us, bariatric surgery? What does that actually mean? Yeah. Well, um, we know that obesity is a, is, a, is a problem in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And most of people with obesity have problem of uh, uh, disease. Yeah. Okay, it comes with a lot of medical problems, diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. stroke, heart attack. So, and there's a problem for them to lose weight. Right. Uh, they have time, many methods, but the effect not long term. Most of the people have problems with weight regain after a few, a few years. So, there's come of the definitive method to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And it's called surgery. Although it's surgery is itself is very yeah, but but for the longest time, yeah. you know, we've been saying that anyone who goes for these kind of surgery mm. do it for cosmetic reasons and yeah. not because of health reasons. Well, I think it's a miscoms, uh, mis concern. Uh, concern, concern. Yeah. Well, I think surgery is a solution for obesity at the moment. Mm -hmm. We know obesity is a disease right. which you cannot control. So. Uh, by doing surgery, uh, you force your body to lose weight, mm -hmm. and it's very effective mm -hmm. in short term and long term. And but the benefit of this surgery not only losing weight, you also reverse a lot of medical condition associated with uh, obesity. Okay, what's the difference between uh, surgery and liposuction? Is there a difference? Different. Yeah. Liposuction basically is a, uh, is a body con body controlling surgery. Mm -hmm. It just remove the periphery fat. Right. 
Barrier surgery is different. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a surgery to change, uh, to arrange the the gut, and is force your body to lose weight. In other words, it deset the set point mm -hmm. of obesity. Right. Uh, by doing obesity, thing, you you change your eating habit. You force the body to lose weight. Okay. So how how, how does this happen internally? So what do you do internally? that changes my eating habits? Well, better surgery is a few surgi surgical procedures available. For example, sleep gastrectomy, which remove 90% uh, of your stomach mm -hmm. to make your stomach with very small tube. Right. And by doing it, you eat very, very small amount of food. Mm -hmm. For example, one banana, one sleep banana, you feel full, you cannot eat anymore. Mm -hmm. So you limited amount the food you eat and force you to lose weight, right. okay? is to reduce the calorie in there a day. So Wouldn't that be the ideal life, eating one banana a day? Yes, yeah. definitely. For those people, mm -hmm. a big eater is a suffering. That's why breast surgery is a, uh, is a very serious consideration to lose weight and it's a final answer for those people with serious obesity. Right. And the other operation which is more aggressive is called bypass surgery where you cut the body in two half and join part, a small power to the upper part of the stomach. You call bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. This is more uh, aggressive surgery and is work for those people with uh, severe obesity and those people with especially have uh, diabetes yeah. and it work well. How many people like when you talk about doing surgeries like this people have to think about it and uh, they have to get second opinions and then probably think about uh, getting the surgery done. Let's talk about young people. How mm -hmm. many young people have you performed this surgery on? Well, I would say most people is a middle income group mm -hmm. where they have tried many methods to lose weight. Right. I've got one patient that spent more than 80,000 to a slimming program or the diet, dietary uh, exercise mm -hmm. and failed to lose weight. Eventually, they come to see me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would say young people, they might not consider this unless it's very, very obese right. and causing medical problem. So, most people, middle income group, may they have. Uh, uh, mean they have resource economically to perform asking for this kind of surgery. Mm -hmm. And most of medical problems occur, obesity, when you're after a uh, certain age group. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't kind of, I don't mm -hmm. see how this works say, saying I, I have a problem with obesity. I need to see a physician first. Then the physician tells me what my problem is and he thinks I need surgery. Does he then uh, refer me to a surgeon like you? Well, I would say battery surgery is a very not new concept in Malaysia. Most mm -hmm. of people don't aware there is this kind of surgery to help people to lose weight. Uh, and of course, in order to see a battery surgeon, you must know there's a center which can perform this right. highly skilled mm -hmm. uh, surgery mm -hmm. with a good outcome. Uh, I would say a, a few centers in Malaysia are able to do it, which is a good outcome. Right. So in order to find this kind of a surgeon, uh, of course, um, they must aware this kind of surgeon. Mm, right. So you, uh, it is quite a niche uh, area of expertise, and only mm. a very few surgeons do it. Yeah. So of course, word goes around that you do it, and if anyone has a problem, they come see you. I would say away. that better mm -hmm. surgery is a safe as removal to go better surgery, provided done by highly trained profession mm -hmm. with all, all the new technology and it was done by keyhole surgery not open surgery where, where the surgeon put a few holes in the start in the abdomen mm -hmm. and put instrument in with the TV it wow. helped and why we do it because obese people is a itself is a dangerous patient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you something go wrong patient can they have serious consequences right you know, when I listen to you talk, you talk about shortening the stomach, uh, doing bypasses. Mm. So with changes like that, there needs to be lifestyle changes, more so dietary changes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, when you talk about dietary changes, they're not small dietary changes. You can't eat like you used to. Yeah. So uh, uh, after surgery, post-surgery, do you give them that training or walk them through the regime as to what they can eat? First, we have... When the patient comes to see me, I have a frank discussion with them. Uh, what is surgery about? How we perform the surgery? What kind of dietary uh, habit they need to change? Because surgery is just part of the program. Mm -hmm. In order to have good outcome, you must follow the diet, 
taking the vitamin and do regular exercise to achieve good outcome. And with the help of dietitian, mm -hmm. there's a uh, the regime of diet, step one to step four. They, we slowly uh, uh, ask you to follow the diet until right. you're able to eat certain so the, amount of food. the various stages, yes. and of course you work yeah. hand in hand with the dietitian yes. yeah. post-surgery in order to make sure the person comes back to optimum uh, uh, health and uh, leads a normal life yeah. again. Now, for people opting for surgeries like this, saying if I have to take leave off work to get a surgery like this done, mm -hmm. how long will I be off work? I would say most people I would ask why to rest for two weeks after surgery. Why? Mm -hmm. First reason is uh, you feel tired after surgery. First, you cannot eat well. Mm -hmm. You feel a little amount of day, you feel very tired. So the best you take two weeks off slowly and once in a diet. Right. Of, only after that, you can uh, maintain I mean, go back your normal life. Right. What are some of the misconceptions about bariatric surgery? Bariatric surgery is a uh, very risky surgery. It's not with the modern technology. It's not risky, mm -hmm. and provided that done by, by, by yeah, like you said, surgeon. you have to be a well-trained well surgeon. surgeon. You just yes. can't be a surgeon. Yes. But you and like I said before, mm. this is a niche area of expertise. Yeah. So it is safe mm. in the right hands. Yes, right. So make sure you see the right person. Okay. Yeah. What are the other misconceptions? Misconception um, or myths surrounding uh, bariatric surgery? Well, uh, I said bariatric surgery not only to people to help to lose weight. Mm -hmm. You also help people to treat obese type 2 diabetes patients. And most of the patients come to see me, not only obese, but they have diabetes. Mm -hmm. So now we change the focus to treat, uh, uh, by using the battery surgery to treat diabetes in a very good outcome. Mm -hmm. Most of my patients is initiate on multiple So when you say diabetes, you're talking about type 2 diabetes yes. here. Yep. Yep. So how does it help with type 2 diabetes? Because it's something you develop and you know, as your pancreas, uh, I mean, uh, doesn't produce any insulin anymore, yeah. or, or loses its ability to produce that insulin, uh, type two diabetes sets in. Now, mm. how do you help that? Well, over the years, we found patient with uh, when after battery surgery, they are obese. We don't know what's the reason that diabetes will control well. So now we know that diabetes may be due to the dysfunction of our, our gut, mm -hmm. the GI tract. So we now find a solution. If you are able to uh, manipulate our gut. Your surgical I mean, diabetes may be disappear. Mm -hmm. So that's why gastric bypass through gastrectomy is very effective at the moment to treat diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, how we work, there's a few uh, possible mechanisms involved. First, you limit the amount of food you eat, reduce calorie in that. Second, you, he al arranged the, the timing of a nutrient sensing in your body, which the send the signal to your brain and etc. Second, you change your bile acid component in your body, mm -hmm. which makes your body more sensitive to glucose and absorption. Second, also it change to the bacteria in your gut, which might affect your body in terms of diabetes. So we do not sure why, but we know that it works at the moment. Right. And that's why worldwide at the moment, they have endorsed bariatric surgery, one of the options to treat those patients with diabetes. Mm -hmm. So in a week or in a month, how many people would you essentially see as a, a surgeon specializing in bariatric surgery? Well, depends on the okay, awareness of the population. I would, say, I would say a month, I would say about 5 to 10, five to come 10 people. asking for opinion for bariatric surgery to treat obesity or diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, I will have friend discussion with them, the option available and also the also financial resource. But we know that Although obesity is a disease, but a problem is, is a very expensive surgery at the moment. Right. Now, I think the million dollar question here yeah. is, how do you ascertain obesity? What is, is obesity? Now, I may be watching this program now, mm -hmm. maybe a bit conscious about my weight and say, oh God, I'm fat. You're not I fat. Need, yeah, <laughs> no. yeah, so <laughs> saying someone's watching it, yeah. and, you know, thinking that he or she is big and uh, they've uh, passed the threshold of uh, obesity, how do you ascertain that? Well. Obesity basically accumulation of fat in your body. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, by conventional way, we can define obesity by a certain parameter. Uh, first, we can use it as a BMI, body mass index, where we divide the weight in kilo, kilo, uh, kilogram into a meter mm -hmm. square. We define a, a certain limit. If your BMI more than 30, you consider obese. 
BMI more than 40 is morbid obese with certain medical condition. So this kind of condition, BMI more than 30 to 35, I would say you're entitled to ask for opinion for obesity surgery. Yeah, more than 30, you fall in the obese category. Obese. 35 is a... When are you a ticking time bomb? 40? 35? I would say when more than 35, you have medical problem. Mm -hmm. It's more than 40, definitely you got a lot of problem. Joint pain, back pain, possible diabetes, hypertension, or heart problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now the new thinking, we call visceral fat in your abdomen. Okay. It's a waist circumference in more than 90s and in Asian population. You consider have a higher risk of metabolic syndrome. Because we call center obesity. This is another concept mm -hmm. for obesity. Mm -hmm. So saying if someone doesn't have obesity, he's, he's big, not a BMI is still in the okay range, but he's having problems with his liver, you know, fatty liver, so on and so forth. Can you do something? Well, if you find, it, it's very strange, obesity. Mm -hmm. It's not about the amount of fat, it's about the distribution of fat in your body. Right. Especially of visceral fat. It's just the center Which abdomen. means... I, I essentially don't have to look big size too. No, I can be fat. It's a fat percentage of your body gives you a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have higher fat percentage with a metabolic, causing your metabolic syndrome, yeah, you, have, you can consider for uh, I mean, metabolic surgery to treat your medical uh, condition. Right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pok, uh, that was a wealth of information from you. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for coming in and for sharing with us all this information about bariatric surgery. Now, uh, for those of you who have uh, questions with regards to all the interviews we had, we spoke to a cardiologist, we're speaking to a surgeon who specializes in bariatric surgery, uh, that is for those of us who suffer from obesity, this is the man to see. Now, if you do have a question for us, send that question to ask at medicaltoday.my, that's A-S-K at medicaltoday.my. And while trying to give you an answer, we'll also furnish you with some vitamins courtesy of Pharma Nyaga right here on Medical Today. Once again, send your question to ask at medicaltoday.my and we'll give you a bottle of uh, vitamins for free right here on Medical Today. Dr. Pog, thank you very much for joining us. Okay, and thank you, thank you uh, for being a part of the show. We'll be back next week with more for you on Medical Today right here on the Brunawa News Channel. You have a great day ahead. Have a fantastic weekend and have an amazing week.